Whew, what a ride I'm about to take you on. Before my investigation, I knew little about niacin, also known as vitamin B3, but after spending weeks poring over the data, I discovered some fascinating rivulets of information. So, does niacin improve heart disease risk? To answer that, I analyzed four studies, of which three were meta-analyses consisting of at least 13 studies. All three of these analyses tell the same story, that niacin does not help against heart disease. But is that really true? Well, according to certain researchers, the answer is no. And if you read what they have to say in their scientific review, you can certainly understand why. Just as one example, they mentioned that putting people on niacin leads to huge changes in their blood lipid profiles. They mention one number that pops up three separate times. That number is 35. According to the review, niacin supplementation can lead to drops in low-density lipoproteins containing cholesterol, as well as blood triglycerides in the amount of 35%. Additionally, increases in high-density lipoproteins, known as HDL, of 35%. If that is true, those are remarkable shifts in one's lipid profile. Interestingly, these trends, so the drop in LDL, triglycerides, and increases in HDL, are actually corroborated in this meta-analysis by the Cochrane Review. Although the delta, so otherwise stated, the amount of change varies based on the study, likely because of the types of people that are sampled. Regardless, the main takeaway is that niacin has these effects. The next question is, how does it have these effects? Exactly what happens when you pop that niacin pill? Okay, we're going to get into the subcellular here in a second. So bear with me. And if you want to skip the mechanism, simply go to the timestamp on the screen. But if you're one of those uber nerds like me, let's magic school bus our way into the details. So we're going to focus on two tissues, adipose tissue or fat tissue and hepatic tissue, liver. Niacin enters the bloodstream and binds the adipocytes, those are fat cells, at a receptor called a GPCR, or a G-protein-coupled receptor. And when the molecule niacin binds, it leads to a shift in the shape of the GPCR, which triggers a reaction within the fat cells. Now, niacin binds a specific type of GPCR, known as an inhibitory GPCR. There are a number of specifics here that I'm glossing over because I don't want to keep the people waiting that are meeting us at the data section, but between you and me, mechanisms make the scientist in me light up. So niacin binds this inhibitory GPCR and the receptor then blocks or inhibits the activity of another enzyme in the fat cells known as adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase is responsible for the production of a molecule called cyclic AMP, which activates an enzyme called protein kinase A. And this protein kinase A activates the processing and release of fat molecules from the fat cell by regulating enzymes like hormone-sensitive lipase. Okay, okay, I get it. That's a lot. Bottom line is, niacin binds the fat cell at the GPCR, and that GPCR reduces the ability for fat cells to release fat molecules because it inhibits that entire cascade of enzymes that I confused you with just now. So the end result is less fat molecules in the blood. Okay, let's follow that fat molecule and they end up at the liver. Here, the liver would normally process them back into triglycerides and then package them into various types of low density lipoproteins like VLDL and LDL. But since there are fewer fat molecules entering the liver, the liver has less to package, so it reduces its LDL release, thereby reducing LDL levels. So by those two mechanisms, inhibition of fat molecule release and reduced fat molecule delivery to the liver, we experience a drop in blood triglycerides and lipoproteins. Well, what about high density lipoproteins, HDL? In short, Niacin inhibits the expression, 
or the production and placement of an HDL receptor on the surface of the cells known as beta ATP synthase and binds another GPCR that directly inhibits the degradation and uptake of HDL. So the cells become less sensitive to HDL in the bloodstream, leaving it out in the bloodstream for longer. As usual, that's probably not all encompassing, but it does get at the crux of the mechanisms. Let's meet up with those that skipped the mechanism section. Ugh. Anyway, after understanding the effect of niacin and mechanisms, it seems reasonable to expect niacin to have positive hard outcome data. In non-technical speak, hard outcomes or hard data are actual end results like heart attacks, stroke, death, and so on. I mean, if you experienced an improved blood lipid profile, wouldn't you expect your risk of heart disease to go down? I imagine you would. Otherwise, you might be wondering why your doctor has their manila folder all twisted up when trying to get you to reduce your LDL and triglycerides. So what does the data show? Well, let's look at this analysis and let's look at the data. Here, the researchers are showing 16 studies, and they've broken up the studies depending on if niacin was consumed with a statin or without a statin. If you're new to physionic, here's how to read the data. You see that middle line, it's above the one mark, which indicates no benefit or harm of niacin therapy. Now, each square and line represents the results of one study. If the square moves more to the left, there is reduced cardiovascular mortality risk. But if it moves to the right, there is an increased mortality with niacin consumption. But that's a lot to take in. So focus your attention on the diamonds, which are an average measure of all the studies above. Here's a fun fact. There's a study in this mix that's highly controversial, and it's going to play a role in this story. But for now, let's focus on the diamonds under each subgroup. Niacin with statin therapy seems to slightly move to the right, indicating more harm. But statistically speaking, that isn't the case. A perfect demonstration of how our eyes can deceive us. On the other hand, niacin without statins moves toward the left, indicating reduced risk. But again, the statistics check us with a whopping p-value of 0.73 for all you stats nerds out there. If that isn't you, all you need to know is niacin has no cardiovascular mortality effect, pro or against. What is fascinating is that this result is unanimous across all three analyses. Niacin had no effect across multiple indices, even less definitive ones like heart attacks, strokes, and so on. So does that end it for niacin? Case closed. We're absolutely done. Finish the video. Come on. You know it's not that easy. One of the questions that we should be asking ourselves is what niacin is being compared against? It makes sense to compare against, well, you know, essentially nothing, or ideally some form of placebo, an inert fake treatment. That way we can start at a fair baseline and look for differences. Unfortunately, if we pull up the data again, see the uh, control written up top? That isn't a standard control. It's actually a statin or a conventional grouping of drugs that niacin is being compared against. So that's kind of an unfair comparison if I can interject my opinion here. I mean, it's not useless. It does still tell us that niacin is not more effective than statins, but it fails to tell us if niacin is effective. You know what's funny? All three analyses did the same thing, comparing against statins. So no wonder they all agreed that niacin is ineffective. But to give the researchers of this analysis credit, they took their analysis just a step further for our benefit. They reanalyzed the data, but excluded comparisons against statins in an attempt to find out the true effect of niacin. What did they find? A fair comparison makes a big difference. I'll start with that. In outcomes like acute coronary syndrome, which is any condition where the heart suddenly has reduced blood flow, like from a blockage, we see that studies without statin administration showed an overall effect 
in favor of niacin. Remember, the diamond is moving to the left, which favors experimental or niacin in this circumstance. How about stroke? Again, a win for niacin, but again, only when niacin is compared when statin is not part of the control condition. Now that said, it didn't always come out on top, even in more neutral comparisons. Sometimes like in measures of coronary heart disease mortality, there was still no benefit. There may be some statistical reasons for that, but as it stands, we have to conclude there is no effect. Okay, things are looking brighter for niacin supplementation, even if it isn't a clean sweep. But here is where I can turn your attention back to something that I briefly mentioned earlier about a uh, controversial study. Well, the researchers of the Scientific Review mentioned a highly influential study that actually led the FDA to renounce their approval of niacin to be paired with statins because, well, as we've seen across many analyses, niacin has no real benefit when mixing it with a statin. Fair enough, but this controversial study was so big that it has massive statistical power, meaning if you're bored, you can skip to this timestamp on screen for the final answer. But if you're into statistics like me, I promise it does lead to a compelling story. Bear with me. This study was so big, causing it to have large statistical power and also having significant statistical weight when it comes to these analyses. And as a result, it sways the results of these analyses more than other studies. And this study found no benefit of niacin. So it might bias the conclusions because it holds so much more weight than any other study. Why is that a problem? Well, one major critique is that this study was performed in largely healthy individuals. And the scientists from this review argue that it seems that would be not the target population to study, but instead study people that are at higher risk of heart disease. I mean, frankly, I think this is a good critique and certainly a possible issue that could easily be accounted for by simply performing a sensitivity analysis, wherein the researchers remove that study from the overall analysis and see if the results stand. And I'll even add a note to this video if such a thing were to ever happen. Okay, so it might be looking brighter for niacin, but there is one significantly worrying trend in the data. Unfortunately, across multiple analyses, the researchers show an increased risk of blood glucose intolerance, significantly raised blood sugar. One analysis calculated an over 30% increased risk and another over 40%. I have an idea of why, but I'll leave that for future content. Still, it's important for you to know, additionally, flushing and gastrointestinal conditions can be exacerbated by niacin. So it's still a flawed supplement. In the end, here's where I land on the topic. Niacin likely has some positive effects in relation to cardiovascular disease outcomes, and it still isn't of much use when paired with statins. Additionally, I am worried for other reasons by this one massive study where I got excited about the statistics. You know, the one where 80% of people skipped, you know, the one. The reason is because this study was in generally healthy individuals and in certain circumstances, it showed negative outcomes. So it might be better for people with actually high LDL, low HDL and high triglycerides to consider talking to their physician about niacin. But if you're already healthy, it may not be prudent. This is, of course, also not considering the elevated blood sugar risk that we discussed and some of the other potential side effects. Niacin is a mixed bag, and while potent, that potency is a double-edged sword. And believe it or not, I actually have a whole lot more to say on this topic. So if you tune in two days, I'll be posting my full study analysis on all these studies right now here. And until then, might I recommend another video of mine right here. Until then, bye.